you can answer, uh, put your questions on there. And also, if you want to raise your hand, we can watch out for you as well. That will not be a problem. Now, Gillian, our retail manager, she's on here somewhere, and she has popped a little link into the Zoom chat just that will take you through to the website because the book's on offer tonight. So anyone who logs in will get the book for £5 only, uh, normally £8.99. So great idea for some early Christmas presents. And she can also take any orders via the chat as well. And thanks to our son, Josh, for setting up the channel and working away in the background for the technical side of things. Hopefully we can get through. And if we uh, want to get handed over, we'll get ready and we'll get started. And we'll actually hand over to our publishing director, Bill Steebley, and he's going to uh, pray for us. Just before I do that, Alison, I'd, yeah. I'd like just to take a minute to say, first of all, our thanks as publishers to David for coming to us with this book. We're delighted to publish it and we hope it gets a very wide audience. It certainly deserves it. Yeah. And I was fascinated and about Chitoke Loki. Uh, there are others watching of my generation and will probably remember hearing excellent missionary reports given by James Caldwell. Uh, James Caldwell was an excellent evangelist and worked in Chitoke Loki and one or two other places as well, but mainly Chitoke Loki for many years. And he was also known for his superb voice. And some of you may have, as I have tucked away in a cupboard, an LP of James Crawford singing a variety of hymns, including one of his favourites, which was Some Golden Daybreak, Jesus Will Come. And it was a thrill to hear him sing. And I'll bore you for another 30 seconds by saying I can remember before it was burned down, being in the St Andrew's Halls, where maybe up to 3,000 people were there for the half yearly missionary meetings. James Caldwell gave his report, which was carefully structured in time by the chairman, but then he sang and you could hear the proverbial pin drop. So there's a long history of excellent work in Chitoke Loki and good to hear what's been happening more recently. And I look forward to hearing what David and Jenny have to say. So should we just commend ourselves to the Lord as we move on. Our Father, we thank Thee for the opportunity of being made familiar with work in Chitoke Loki. We thank Thee for a long history there with thousands of lives affected by the work of believers who've gone there to do preaching and to do uh, clinical work. And we thank Thee for that long history and pray that it might continue until the Lord comes. We thank thee for those who've given time and effort to be part of that. And we just look to thee to bless each one of them. We know that they are no man's debtor. And so we look forward this evening to hearing of this work. Can we look to thee to bless David and Jenny too in the work that they continue to do in a variety of ways. And we thank thee for the opportunity of hearing them tonight. So we just commend us to thee. Pray thy blessing to be upon them and upon the work that they are speaking about. And we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much, Bill. And thank you, Alison, for your very kind comments. It's a great pleasure to be part of this event. And I'm really grateful to John Ritchie Publishing and to General Manager Alison Banks in particular for being so enthusiastic and encouraging me in taking this writing project to publication. I'll tell you the story of the genesis of the book from my point of view really. It was never it was never ever my intention to set about to write this. It arose out of regular messages, emails and blog posts that I used to send back home from my various trips to Chitokoloki. Uh, apart from one trip which I did with Jenny and she had done one independently of me as well, I generally travelled to Zambia on my own. My wife Christine uh, not a great fan of wildlife in any shape or form and never keen on the idea of creepy crawlies. And anyway, she had loads of other activities and responsibilities at home. And so at the end of each day, I would typically just sit down with the computer and write down some of the events, often the almost unbelievable events that took place pretty much on a daily basis. And after several years and several visits, I realised that I had more than enough material to adapt into a more accessible 
narrative and so controlled chaos is the result of that. So the chapters actually really just set out to give a picture of a day, a day in the life of the mission or the mission partners in Chitokoloki. And it's my purpose today, this evening, to give you a bit of a rapid fire introduction to the place, to the people and to the content that we've tried to capture uh, in the book. <clears throat> so in order to do that, I'm going to share my screen and uh, show you a few pictures just to uh, give you, I hope, a bit of a flavour of what Chitoka Loki uh, is like. <clears throat> so I'm hopeful you can see that uh, screen now. That's an image, an image of the book. So here we go. We'll just get straight ahead with this. When you think of Zambia, you probably think of wildlife. You think of vast savannas, incredible scenery. It is, of course, the location of the smoke that thunders, also known as the Victoria Falls. Not the highest or the widest, but still classified as the largest waterfall in the world by dint of its combined width of about 1,700 metres and its depth of about 100 metres. Zambia, according to the World Bank, ranks among the countries with the highest levels of poverty in the world. Some 58% of its 16.5 million people earn less than the international poverty line of $1.90 US per day. Chitoka Loki is indicated on the map there, on the northwestern province of the country. Now about three quarters of the poor people live in rural areas rather than in towns or cities. And this image shows you the same river that cascades over the Victoria Falls at Livingston. But here, hundreds of miles upstream, is a tranquil, beautiful river. But as we'll see, it's also potentially deadly. Now, experience in rural Africa presents the Western traveller with no end of contrasts. Transportation for me from Glasgow was by means of a luxurious Emirates 777-300 to Lusaka. And then in Lusaka, I transferred in contrast to my onward connection to Chitokoloki International Airport. And that was by means of this beast, Charlie Tango Oscar, the Chitokoloki Mission Plane, a Cessna 206. And instead of sitting away back in the wide-bodied jet, you have a seat right beside the pilot. But not before he has a look under the bonnet or the hood, as our US cousins like to call it. Perhaps a little disconcerting for some. That's Chris Brundage, all the way from Thunder Bay in northern Canada. And he is the pilot stationed at Chitokoloki at the moment. Soon we're in the air, all is well, and after about three hours of cruising, we finally reach the vicinity of Chitokoloki. And if I can demonstrate with my mouse, and you can hopefully see this image, right at the top there, as indicated by the arrow, is the airstrip. Just above it, you can barely see it through the mist or the haze, is the Zambezi River. And these buildings, a little bit closer to the foreground, uh, are the hospital and the surrounding buildings. When you can see what the local vicinity is like. These are the typical African dwellings in the bush, very basic primitive houses. And many of them, and here's the plane coming into land, are very close to the airstrip. And so when the plane arrives, it always attracts a great deal of local interest and the crowds come out to see what on earth is going on. This image shows you what the hospital looks like, or looked like rather, from the air. Uh, this is taken at a time of year when everything is green and fertile. On my first trip there in 2015, I arrived in October of that year and pretty much all the vegetation was burnt to a crisp. But let me just introduce you to a few of the characters and the personnel who make this place so special. Here are David and Lorraine. David and Lorraine McAdam. David is often the only doctor for the entire hospital and is keen to take help from other specialists from time to time. But he essentially looks after all the specialty care, the surgery, the anaesthetics, obstetrics, neonatal care, including any subspecialty you care to name, urology, gynaecology, internal medicine, ophthalmology. I can honestly say I've never encountered a clinician with such a breadth of clinical skill and experience. Truly remarkable and indeed, I think, unparalleled in the Western world. Lorraine, too, is an accomplished multitasker, as you can imagine, a senior nurse herself and a midwife in her own right. She's heavily involved in the hospital work 
and in many of the other mission activities. Here's another character. This is Dr. Mwansa. You'll hear more about Mwansa from Jenny shortly. But Mwansa spent about four years in Chit. She's a Zambian by birth and is currently actually working in Glasgow in a job in paediatric gastroenterology. Her medical training was from Beijing, strangely enough, and her teaching was all in Chinese. Quite remarkable. But she was a tremendous asset in Chitokoloki, capable of dealing with surgical emergencies and all manner of other patient-related problems that arose. <clears throat> as well as the medical staff, there are several expat nurses. This is Caitlin Spicinger. She is based in Chit with her husband, Joey, and their three small children. Joey is the aircraft mechanic, looks after the plane, and actually looks after just about every other mechanical maintenance or repair task that might be required. And then there are some local chaps. There are two likely lads. This on the left is John Chalanda, and on the right, Kayumbo. Both of them feature in the book, and both of them are trained really to work in the hospital. They have various responsibilities. I took this picture when they were taking supplies to the aircraft to sustain a day's operating at Chivuma Mission Hospital that some of you will have heard of just a short flight away. And here's just a collection of images featuring Jenny and some of the local staff there. You can see the nurse that she's with is called Womba. There's Kayumbo and Chalanda again and Jenny with a couple of her small patients. When I arrived in Chitokoloki for the first time, I was struck by the beauty of the place. It's on a, an incredible spot, high on the plain above the Zambezi. And you'll notice from this image under the African flame tree in glorious bloom, what appear to be a series of headstones and memorials to various mission staff members who have died or have been killed over the years. A very poignant place. One in particular you may recall because it made international headlines in the summer of 2012 when Jay and Katrina Erickson were killed. Their plane came down in the river. They lost their lives and their two little children were left orphaned. Just an example of the risks and the sacrifice that sometimes attends missionary service in the developing world. When I got there for the first time, Chris took me around the entire site, which is about a square kilometre and just beyond what you find is similar characteristics, moving around the villages, loads of children, children everywhere who are anxious to get into the image that you're taking with your camera. Look at these kids here, just as happy as can be, but you get a real sense of the poverty from a picture like this. Few, if any of them, have any kind of shoes and they're dressed, as you can see, in rags. And they live in flimsy houses, buildings mostly made of straw, some with thatched roofs, most with thatched roofs, some with tin roofs, some actually made of some of the local brick, but many of them very rudimentary buildings as you can see. And and look at this, the yellow plastic cans scattered all around, these are used for transporting the family water supply from the river, or perhaps from a local borehole. And you can see here that some of the houses are actually a bit more substantial made of brick, but again with a, a thatched roof. Down by the river I came across these men who were uh, heaving the clay bricks that they'd carved out of the ground, taking them over to a kiln that they were building. There's Chris speaking to some of the guys building the kiln and they light the fires inside these tunnels and they bake the bricks so that they're ready for building. Now I can show you many, many pictures. We don't have time for all that many, but one of the overriding features about the people who live in the communities around Chitokoloki is their cheerfulness and their resilience and their fortitude. They're a lovely, welcoming people. Notice here, no need for buggies or strollers or baby carriages or kitchens. What kitchen? Here is food preparation. This is Nshima being prepared al fresco style. And in the grounds of the old hospital, the hospital that James Caldwell would have known, here they are preparing to cook outdoors, retrieving water from a local borehole. The new hospital that you saw from the air a few moments ago uh, is reasonably well equipped considering and when you arrive there at the main entrance, you'll meet someone like this. This is Frank. He is a security guard and he takes no nonsense, I can tell you. And as you get inside, this is the kind of view that you might be met by in the male ward. Densely populated, as you can see. Note the mosquito nets hanging there. The patients and various family members and their carers are there. And look at the mattresses you can just see on the floor. They serve as extra beds. And just around the corner, there's the queue 
a queue for the outpatient clinic. All these patients are waiting sometimes for the better part of an entire day in the heat, holding their blue medical records. Life there is simple, but it's certainly not trouble-free by any stretch of the imagination. What CHIT does provide, however, is Western-style free healthcare in a hospital that actually attracts patients from many hundreds of miles around, many of them arriving on foot or by ox cart. This is a picture of someone's back, but despite the free service and the advanced Western medicine and surgery that's available, the local traditional healers who make marks like this in people's skin, the witch doctors, still hold the population under their malign influence. Many patients, some detailed in the book, suffer permanent damage such as blindness or worse as a result of their ministrations. So what about the dangers that we know little about? There are some specific dangers that we just don't experience in the UK or the USA. Malaria is one. Here's a picture of an Anopheles mosquito responsible through malaria for about one and a half million deaths worldwide every year. Here's a character you may not have ever seen before. This is a hugely enlarged view of a little freshwater fluke that causes untold damage in rural Africa. This is Schistosoma mansoni, named after a Scotsman, interestingly enough. This is the cause of a disease called Bilharzia, which is absolutely rife in that part of the world. More obvious and more terrifying, although maybe in public health terms not so damaging, the apex predator whose territory is the river is this character, the Nile crocodile. And in the book you'll find many examples of patients that we looked after. There can be few Glasgow surgeons who have anything like the experience that I've managed to garner there of dealing with patients with crocodile attack injuries. Not so common on the Clyde. Now here's an example of a patient. I'm going to resist the temptation of showing some of the more devastating injuries resulting from croc attacks, but this chap is a patient that we cared for who sustained his injury, a bite in the river, not by a croc, but by a hippopotamus. His leg actually is incidental to that story because his injury was on his bottom, and I'm not going to show you that, but I couldn't resist taking this picture of his prosthetic foot, a homemade artificial leg, Actually, his lower leg had been blown off in a landmine incident and he fashioned his own artificial leg from melted down plastic containers and even carved himself a fairly creditable wooden foot. As well as crocodiles and rivers, the dangers are not confined there. Venomous snakes can also cause carnage. People fear the notorious black mamba. It's venom causing paralysis and death within just a few short hours, depending on the dose, and yet easily correctable with anti-venom. But success is really dependent on getting to the hospital on time. I saw the death of an eight-year-old girl who was subjected to local medicine by the witch doctors, not brought to the hospital until she was virtually dead, in extremis. And when she died, we discovered that her brother had been taken by a crocodile in the river just a matter of weeks before. It's hard to understand or comprehend the tragedy for the family concerned. But look at this smiling plucky wee lad who actually lost his hand. There's his amputated forearm as, as a result of a venomous snake bite. Now it would really be remiss of me not to introduce another absolutely key member of the Chitokoloki scene. This is JR, Julie Rachel Elwood from Northern Ireland. Julie Rachel certainly kept me right when I was there. She's an incredibly versatile and talented person. Not only is she a midwife by background, looks after all maternity services, but oversees the rest of the hospital activity as well. Pretty much across the board, she's a capable anaesthetist, ultrasonographer, researcher, administrator, manager. And one of her particular skills and responsibilities there actually is to look after the specialty care of the babies and children who present with club foot, even operating on those who need tendon release procedures. Again, a remarkable and unparalleled skill set. Now I'm going to take you into the operating theatre in Chitoko Loki and it's not like this. This is what I was very accustomed to working in a modern academic centre in a city hospital in Glasgow. Chitoko Loki is not quite so palatial. This is the theatre there and here I am operating using a telescope 
Normally that telescope would connect to a video camera, but unfortunately, being Africa, we had almost a fully complete set of kit, but not quite. The monitor is actually lying on the stack, which you can just see behind my head there. It's lying face down because we had no cable to connect the monitor to the camera. So there we are using the time-honoured Admiral Lord Nelson approach to telescopic surgery. On a subsequent visit, thankfully, we managed to get the monitor working. And here we are bringing for the first time fully functional, minimal access video surgery to Chitoka Loki. A great benefit, actually, for selected patients. That's Jenny at the head of the table. Uh, the others around there, you can see JR <laughs> taken by the novelty of this, taking a picture of the screen with her phone. Uh, and the others there are Kayumbo and Dr. Mwansa. There's a, another view of Jenny uh, pretending to be an anaesthetist and supervising the anaesthetized patient. But actually, the reality is better shown by this image because this image shows what genuinely goes on. Notice the maintenance guys are never far away. Equipment failures are common. And occasionally, despite the fact that Chitoka Loki has an amazing array of solar panels giving fantastic power, the power sometimes does go down. And in the middle of an operation like this, that can be a little challenging. We managed to complete this procedure using the light from a couple of iPhones. Chitoka Loki gets quite a few visitors <clears throat> and they're very well equipped to deal with and very hospitable, <clears throat> pardon me, towards visitors. This is one of them. This is a colleague of mine, a fellow called Kevin Kerrigan on the left of the screen. He is uh, from Spokane in Washington state, a uh, very fine uh, American surgeon with a huge experience in various mission settings, including parts of South America, Papua New Guinea, Ethiopia, Rwanda, and recently in the last couple of years, even in Iraq. It was a real privilege to work with and learn from Kevin. He came with his wife, Leslie, and there we are <coughs> operating with David with his usual smile in the background. One of the common procedures we do that I never ever did really in, in clinical practice in Scotland was cesarean section. There we are with Caitlin, with Lorraine in the background, with the happy outcome of a successful uh, cesarean section. I've got a story about a cesarean section in the book somewhere which actually uh, corresponds with one of the experiences I've had which I've called the fright of my life and well you have to buy the book to read about that. Just before I conclude let me just show you the three old clinicians. Here we are. I couldn't resist this picture either. This is David and myself flanking the lady in the middle who is Dr. Roz, Dr. Roz Jefferson. Roz spends about half her time now in Chitoka Loki. She's a pediatric neurologist. She looks after the children when she's there. She's a wonderful cook and a hostess. And actually, generally speaking, she's a force of nature demonstrating energy levels regardless of the time of day or night that can only be described as legendary. And she came into theatre that day to show us these homemade crutches. All of these folks feature in some way in the stories that we've assembled and that we tell in Controlled Chaos. Now, I was hoping that Jenny would be able to join us live tonight, but unfortunately she's on duty in the Royal Victoria Infirmary in Newcastle-upon-Tyne where they've if you've been watching the news, just had some desperate uh, activity this week with four young people in their late teens all losing their lives with drug-related incidents and some of them actually coming in under the care of Jenny and her colleagues in the RVI. But this is a picture of her <laughs> in Chit having extracted some foreign body that she carved from someone's foot. Uh, so anyway, right now what we've done is we've recorded a a seven minute video where she'll read a few excerpts from the chapters she contributed to Controlled Chaos. This is the picture we put on the back of the cover showing the two of us <clears throat> in New Zealand. She worked in New Zealand or so for a year or so uh, a couple of years back. So just before we move to that video, let me simply flag up the page for the book that I put on my website. The book has lots of black and white images uh, and if you prefer to see the full colour gory variety then they are available on the web and I can just try and connect you to this uh, live right now. So that's just a picture taken from my site. And if I just expand this, <clears throat> this is my home page. You'll see a flag at the top that says books. And uh, under the flag of John Ritchie uh, publications, we've got Controlled Chaos there. And 
another book coming out, I hope, within the next month or so. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about that on, on a subsequent occasion, I hope. But if you come to this page, you just click on the on the book image there and you'll come to a couple of excerpts from the book and all these images. So here we are. This is a picture that I took in Chavuma of a baby having a bath. I thought that was quite nice. There's Chavuma Mission Hospital itself. You just click on these images, you'll get uh, the full colour version. Here is a picture I took down by the Zambezi, uh, close to sunset, as you can see. So there we are. We'll head back to the... Uh, let me just stop sharing the screen and I'll just mount the, uh, the video that Jenny has recorded and then hand back <coughs> to Alison and we'll take any questions or comments that, that people have. So let me see if I can just... Uh, this video will run for 7 minutes and 31 seconds to be exact. So if you bear with me, it's coming on momentarily. So Jenny, you went to Chitokoloki when you were a medical student. Tell us about your impressions when you arrived there. Um. My first impression was that it was quite overwhelming. So my friend Lindsay and I came back after our first day and we just thought that was unbelievable. I felt like I'd seen every possible diagnosis that there is of tropical medicine and general medicine and general surgery and it had only been one day. We had been thrown right into the deep end with um, emergencies going on right, left and centre and they didn't really the staff there didn't really mind that we fell out of our depth and they didn't really mind that we had never done most of the things that we were being asked to do before. <laughs> uh, they just, you know, told us that we should get on with it. So it was quite uh, overwhelming would be my first impression. How long did you spend there when you went for the first time? Uh, so the first time I was there uh, was a six week elective. So just over a month. Now, you've written a good chunk of the book, Controlled Chaos, and it would be good if you could maybe select a couple of excerpts and maybe just read them, and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay. Um, I'll just read from part of one of my chapters. I've written, I love the atmosphere of community here in the hospital. Community essentially means absolutely no privacy. If you ask a patient a leading question such as, have you been doing your exercises? Or do you drink much alcohol? The patient will always respond and tell you the answer you want to hear. The giveaway sign is that the rest of the 20 patients in the ward all crack up laughing when they hear the lies, indicating to you that things might not be as they seem. As we traipse from bed to bed down the long line of patients and then back up the other side, everyone's ears and eyes are on the patient who is in question. Not only other patients, but their caregivers too, who might be any family member from grandson to great auntie and their dependents along with them. And of course, any blue man who was a cleaner who may be passing by and helpfully edge into the conversation to translate. Everyone gives their tuppence worth, whether it is required or not. And the heckling makes me feel quite at home. So you said that when you went there at first, you were suddenly just given all this extra responsibility so how did you adapt to that? Tell us about, or maybe you've got something you can read to us about your experience of just being on your own and having to fend for yourself. Yes, that happened more the second time I went than the first time because I'd had already one year of experience of being a doctor. And so to everybody there, that was plenty of experience. And I was kind of left to do things, especially the ward rounds because everyone else who was there was a surgeon and they wanted to go to theater. So uh, I've got a little bit in my chapter about doing the ward round by myself, which I will read. Thursday, I do not know how this happened, but I ended up on the ward round by myself. Dad said a quick hello to those in intensive care and then toddled off to theatre and everyone else disappeared. I quite enjoy the banter on the ward round and making my own decisions. <coughs> in this hospital, I find myself discharging patients, stopping antibiotics, People seem to be on cloxacillin for months at a time. And in my opinion, that is asking for antibiotic resistance. Increasing painkillers, maybe I'm too soft. Um, and for any that are too hard to deal with, I say, you need to go to theater and see Dr. Galloway Senior. 
So a new patient was admitted with a leg wound. None of the nursing staff were enthusiastic about undoing his dirty bandage. So I told myself, don't be proud, Jenny. This is a job for you. You can imagine my horror as a large pus filled wound was exposed, which was absolutely crawling with maggots. I could not have retreated from that bedside any faster. Maybe not a job for me after all. The smell was awful. These were nice little sterile maggots like you get in Britain to help the wound heal. These were massive, fat, yellow, flesh-eating maggots that were falling out of the bed and onto the floor. And I immediately regretted my choice of flip-flops that day. I'm still itching at the memory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. What is the, uh, the last little section you're going to read to us? What's that about? Um, this one is about uh, when I was asked to um, help in theatre. The surgeons that I worked with were very keen, like Dr McAdam was very keen that I should get a lot of experience, um, even though I wasn't particularly enthusiastic myself necessarily all the time. Um, and I quite enjoyed it, but I also just quite often um, terrified. <laughs> Um, so I've got a little bit in the book that I'll read about um, when I was asked to help in theatre. I had the opportunity today to close an abdomen after a major operation. This is meant to be the easy bit. My problem was that I developed a sore back because the operating table here slowly sinks down during the operation. It can be elevated by pumping a foot pedal, but it slowly and imperceptibly sinks down again so that before you know it, you're bent in the middle, deep in concentration, trying to fiddle about with tiny instruments and needles. It's honestly so difficult. Dad sutures big wounds in no time, and I fiddle around for ages just trying to get my needle onto the needle holder, which to me looks just like every other instrument on the tray. Mwansa was also saying that I keep putting the needle in too deep. She wanted me to go along the line of the wound, just under the surface of the skin. And if I dared venture into the subcutaneous tissue, she would say, too big. We are talking in millimetres here. Absolutely no mercy for my shaky hands and achy back. Good. Well, thanks very much, Jen. That was uh, excellent. Um, so have you been able to share the book a little bit with some of your friends and colleagues? Yeah, so um, I was working in Glasgow when the book came out and a lot of my colleagues heard about it and a few uh, bought some copies. Uh, even had one of my friends who's a healthcare assistant, her best friend, sent me a, a message on Instagram and said she wants to read it. So yeah, there's been quite a lot of interest. Some of my school friends uh, have been reading it as well and I'm getting positive feedback. So that's good. Well, it's good that you were able to record this because we appreciate that as this is live streamed, you will be in the depths of the emergency department in the Royal Victoria Hospital, all being well and uh, fending off some of the badness there. But thanks very much for uh, for reading these excerpts and for adding your recommendation to the book. And I hope that it adds a little bit of extra interest to those that might be contemplating uh, either buying the book to help Chutok Loki, because after all, all the proceeds will go directly to the work of the Mission Hospital there. But uh, good to have you involved in this tonight. So thanks very much. So there we are. With that, I think I'll maybe hand back to Alison or Raymond and uh, let them take the programme from there. Thank you very much. Well, David, thank you very much. As most know, Alison and I sometimes work as a team. And for some reason, I get left with everything at the end to do with all the questions, etc. <laughs> but I have to say, David, I'm sure everybody would agree who is on Zoom tonight. That was very, very interesting to see the slides and obviously to see the job that you and Jenny and of course, others who are still out there at the moment uh, doing this. Uh, and as you said, everybody who buys a book tonight, a, a proportion of the profit will certainly go out to the mission and that will go via the Lord's uh, Work Trust because you are certainly doing a tremendous job out there. I was just laughing actually, my daughter is training to be a nursery nurse, or she is a nursery nurse, and she's in another room watching this. And once or twice she says, Dad, I think I would love to go out there and help so one of the questions, and if anybody does want to ask any questions, you can actually type it on the chat at the bottom of the Zoom. Uh, that's maybe the easiest thing to do because I can only see 25 screens at a time. So if you have got a question, if you just pop it onto the chat and then I'll file these to David. We did tell David, hopefully the questions won't be too hard and I'm sure they wouldn't be tonight. But I suppose one of the questions is, David, if somebody did want to go to the Mission Hospital just to help, 
Is there a procedure or anything that you have to go through uh, to go there at all? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, first thing to say is that the folks in Chautauqua Loki are very, very accommodating and very keen to have people come and visit and help. <clears throat> now, help comes in all sorts of shapes and forms. And uh, I know that some folks have sometimes been a little bit more of a burden than a real help. And so I think if you do have something to contribute or think that you can help in some way, and that might be something other than being involved in the hospital work. There's church activity, there's school activity, there's all sorts of stuff to process, supplies and so on are coming in by container and all need to be sorted out and uh, resources being made for local folks, patients and so on. So there, there certainly there are, there are lots of opportunities and the folks there are very keen to to welcome uh, individuals that can help. Yeah. The, procedure, the procedure is you have to make, make your way there. Um, actually, it's not difficult because if you can get yourself to Lusaka by whatever means, Chris and the plane is down in Lusaka quite a lot. And so the way to do this would be to contact Gordon Hanna, who is the senior Canadian uh, mission partner, who's really kind of the administrator in the entire site. And Gordon can advise about uh, what the operation the accommodation availability might be and so on but uh, it's wonderful i mean I, I i've recorded this in the book actually i mean i was just blown away by the kindness of the folks there i, I did wonder how i might survive in terms of cooking for myself and you know trying to work and do all of that at the same time it just wasn't an issue it was all done for me really one of the questions that's just come through here david is um thank you very much for your so, uh, for doing what you're doing tonight they're saying where is the support most needed is it financing the mission or is it the training the mission workers ah no i'm not sure that i'm the best person to answer that there's always a need for resources always i mean it's a, it's actually a big and busy mission where they offer employment to a lot of the local folks so they've got lots of men working uh, in maintenance and looking after the grounds and in building work and so on. Lots of people working in the hospital that are partly supported by by the mission as well. So, so there's certainly a need for resources. Uh, in terms of, you just wonder sometimes, you know, looking at somewhere like that, the way that God has planned this is, is a little difficult for us to really see. But, you know, you would think that looking at the, the program as it stands right now, some of the missionaries are are a little bit more mature than they used to be and so you just wonder about sustainability for the future and, and that's obviously something that that uh, may provoke others to think about how they could perhaps contribute and go and it's interesting just to reflect on the way that mission generally has kind of changed in the last decade or two with fewer people tending to go for long periods of time and perhaps more folks coming and going a little bit with short term contributions and so there's there's lots of there's a, a mixed bag of possibilities there but uh, all of that sort of help i'm sure could be could be fitted in now one of the questions that just came in i suppose mm -hmm. it's a very up-to-date question is from andrew lacy who's a manager up at the bookshop uh, up in glow and also for douglas robertson they're just asking how has the covid pandemic what's happened out at the mission hospital has it been overrun with it or do you know anything about that yeah, no, mercifully, they, they've managed so far, as I understand it, to pretty much escape. Uh, I have been in touch a little bit with David, although not for the last three weeks, perhaps. But about three weeks ago, he was saying that they really hadn't seen any active COVID cases in the Kukuloki. You know, it would be just unimaginable to have well people uh, in Chidokoloki with COVID, they have two ventilators on the entire site, two working ventilators. So they would they would just have huge problems. They've got, I mean, David was saying they've got some PPE left over from the Ebola scare of a few years ago, but uh, they would struggle with PPE. But there are there are Zambian regulations, of course, now. And so when they meet in the church, for example, they all sit there with masks on, as, as we do in this country. And so they're taking the risk seriously, although mercifully so far, they uh, they haven't really come across any uh, major outbreak, which is good. It's quite scary, I suppose, when you think over here, you know, we worry about PPE and everything else to do with COVID. And when you say they've only got two ventilators, that's pretty scary compared to what we've got 
uh, over here. Uh, another question that's come in here, and this is maybe a general question just for yourself. Did you always want to be a surgeon when you were a little boy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think so, no. I, I, I guess I mean, if I was to track back and try and analyse my thinking, I probably wanted to to get involved in some kind of science. I quite like chemistry and stuff like that. But it was really at senior secondary school I decided to do medicine. And then when I get into medicine, I quickly decided that the life of a, of a physician probably didn't really suit my personality. I was a bit more kind of keen to be in, involved in the action than hands on and so on. And so I, I uh, adopted a surgical training at that stage. I actually was always interested, even the way back then, in getting involved in some way. I mean, I'm ashamed to say that, you know, just the demands of career and then family coming along it actually makes it difficult to to just dislocate yourself and go out there and retain some kind of career in the UK while being involved out there. So it was really when I retired from clinical practice in 2015 that I went out there for a couple of months for the first time. And then I've been out regularly since, although unfortunately not this year because of the pandemic. The one question that's come in here, they've said, um, what is the relationship between the mission and the formal medical services and the government? Yeah, good question. Uh, and again, I'm not perhaps the best person to answer that in great detail. That said, the uh, it's now the case that all of us who go there are encouraged to have proper registration with the Health Professions Council of Zambia. So I've gone through that process of being registered. Um, I think that's really important that you know you take proper professional responsibility for your actions there. The Ministry of Health do support the hospital, do fund some of the staff, uh, and do visit from time to time. Uh, there's a little incident that I've recorded in the book where they where they came through when I was perhaps less than totally official as far as the the uh, administration was concerned, but uh, they were very accommodating and very welcoming and just said you know carry on and uh, David David McAdam was pretty relaxed about it as well though I think I think more and more everyone is becoming a little bit more careful about just making sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed but there is there is certainly a, a sort of hand and glove relationship with the Ministry of Health um, for example when JR does the order for drugs it was commonly the case that she would request certain drugs that they felt they needed that they were running low on stock and what arrived from the <laughs> From the Ministry of Health bore no relationship to what had been ordered. You just get what is available, and that seemed to be a recurring feature. So you know it, it has it has some challenges for sure. One of the questions is asked here, David. Obviously, when you're out there, you're doing a lot of operations. Um, do you get an opportunity to speak to some of the patients about the Lord Jesus, and have you seen anybody who's put their trust in the Lord Jesus? Yeah, well, um, I'm cer I certainly know of some. Um, you do get an opportunity to speak about your faith. I mean, one of the things that one of the things that happens now, if I go, I'm pretty well assured that my name will be on the speaking program for the church, and they beam that into the hospital and put it across the tannoy system. Um, there's also an opportunity. I mean, the, the local mission partners really look after this, but from time to time, you have an opportunity to give a bit of a message, share something. You know, either with the staff or indeed with the patients, uh, it has to be translated if it's being broadcast to the patients in the hospital. But no, there are opportunities like that, and there are certainly stories. You get many, many stories if you read the stuff that's coming from from JR or from the McAdams or from others who who visit Chitokoloki. You'll soon find that there are many stories of people who not only have their medical needs addressed but their spiritual needs addressed as well. I suppose another question maybe in connection with that as well is somebody has asked the question when you obviously go for the UK out there you take obviously some surgical material with you has that ever been an issue getting that through customs getting it through border control etc or is there a border control out there <laughs> yeah no there's certainly controls um I, I was concerned I mean the only time I was really challenged was in Glasgow uh, when they told me that if there was anything suspicious in my bulky baggage then uh, and I explained to them were some surgical instruments you know there's some stapling guns and different things and the girl looked horrified at that prospect but she said if it was if it was uh, considered to be suspect then it wouldn't get through it wouldn't get through onto the aircraft anyway everything arrived and it's never been a problem the only the only problem has been in my mind worrying about whether it's actually going to emerge at the other side but it always has 
I must say, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed reading your book. And I think, as Alison said, it's one of these books, once you start reading it, you don't want to put it down. But what I thought was interesting in your book, you give life lessons. You know, if people are coming out, you probably know where I'm going with this. One of your life lessons was to do with if you're taking a shower or if you're brushing your teeth. Maybe you could just explain if anybody's wanting to go out what you shouldn't do if you're taking a shower or brushing your teeth. Yeah, well, one of the early respondents to the book when it emerged at first was actually JR, the, the girl that I showed who's who's been such a central figure in Chitokoloki. And she she said, very kind of her to say so, but she, she reckoned it should be it should be um, essential reading for anyone that was planning to visit. Um, I, th I hope we've managed to capture some of the crazy stuff that goes on there. But in terms of life lessons, yeah, I mean, you're, you're using water, which is pretty safe, but maybe not 100% safe. So you use bottled water to clean your teeth. You keep your mouth closed in the shower, stuff like that. You know, you just have to be extra careful where you would normally be blasé about these things, you just have to... I mean, it's like the pandemic, you know, we're all having to learn new things about infection control. Well, you know, the way that you behave, the way that you look after your own safety in terms of mosquito nets and all of that sort of stuff, you know, you just have to be be aware and be sensible. Maybe just got a couple more questions, David. Uh, one of them uh, has come in here again and it says, um, to do with, you know, if you saw somebody who hasn't been too well and you think maybe there's no hope for them, have you seen that through prayer that that person has actually got better? You've thought, you know, medically they maybe couldn't get better, but through prayer they have actually got better? No, I don't think I can actually point to any particular incident in Chitoka Loki. Others, no doubt, will have some experience of that. Um, but, you, you know, you're, you've pinned me down with a very specific scenario there. And in all honesty, I, I don't think I can say that I've seen some unexpected or miraculous recovery as a result of people praying. I, mean, I don't doubt for a minute that, that yeah. an almighty God can, can reverse things that we can't reverse. Yeah. And I used to, used to say to, to the medical students, you know, as, as a doctor, you'll be able to maybe adjust the time and the place of someone's demise, but you won't, you won't be able to adjust its inevitability. I suppose maybe not a medical act of prayer, but I read in the book one night, you were called out at one o'clock in the morning and in the road back in the pitch black, you heard something coming towards you and you weren't sure what kind of animal it was, but I take it, it never attacked you that night. No, it didn't attack me. It came pretty close, I must say. And actually, um, I've got a story in the book about the fellow who was sharing the house that they gave me to live in. He, he was an interesting fellow from Holland. Um, his name was James. I, I won't maybe just uh, spoil this too much, but, but it did turn out that this was a, a pretty wild dog that was lurking around and, and it tended to run at people in the middle of the night. Well, James being bold and brash and 18 years of age, his technique in dealing with this was to simply bark at the dog. So I can remember lying in bed one night, all I could hear was the dog barking at James and James barking back at the dog and mercifully it didn't tackle any of us, so we survived. Well, that's great, David. We do certainly appreciate you taking the time out tonight to be here. Uh, and just looking at the screen, I know there's certainly, I think there's about maybe four pages of screens, so I reckon that's about 100 screens uh, altogether. I know there's obviously one or two from the Lord's Work Trust. I can see three in particular. I won't name them at the moment, but they're all sitting here watching. Uh, so there are various people from all over. So we do thank everyone who's taken the time out tonight. I say this has been our first uh, virtual book launch, and hopefully there will be more like this um, coming up. Uh, so what we'll maybe just do, we might just commend ourselves to God in prayer. Remember, again, there is the link up at the top of the chat if you want to order this book, and I'm sure many of you will. Uh, I say many of the stories are fascinating that in the book, and I'm sure it would give us all a great insight into the work that goes out in the mission field. So let's just commend ourselves to God in prayer. Our Father, we do thank you this evening that we can come into thy presence. We do so, our Father, in the lovely name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus. We do thank you, our Father, for this time. Uh, that we've just set aside this evening to come and listen to David and through Jenny with the video as well of the work that they were doing out there in Jyoti Loki. We do thank your Father for all the patients that they deal with. We do thank your Father for uh, all the things that are going on out there. And we do pray for those who are still there and who are dealing with individuals 
on a daily basis. We just ask our Father that through this work that many of them will come and will accept the Lord Jesus as their own and personal saviour, that those who are out there might be able to witness to these people. And we do ask our Father that many will come and accept the Lord Jesus as their own and personal saviour. We just ask again our Father that they would just take care of us all. We think of the pandemic that is going on at the moment and we just ask our Father that they would just keep us all safe and free from this. So our Father, we do thank you again for this time that we spent together. And we just ask you to look after us all now as we just uh, retire for the evening as we ask all these things returning thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thanks again, everyone, for coming on. And we do trust that God will bless every one of us in the days ahead. Thank you. Thank you.